Bristol, Vermont, and WNYV Whitehall, Glens Falls. It's 8 o'clock. Good morning. This is Northern Light for Friday, December 1st. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. A federal court has sentenced a mother and son from Watertown for their participation in the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. We'll have the details coming up. Over the last few years, murals have been been, been popping up all over the city of Glens Falls. They've been breathing new color into the downtown area. We take a look at the city's mural renaissance with local artist Hannah Williams. I really try to stress to people that bringing public art, whether it's sculpture installation murals can bring economic value to areas. Also on the show, John Warren checks trail conditions in the Adirondacks. Our Champlain Valley reporter, Kara Chapman, stops by to give us the lowdown on holiday events in Plattsburgh this weekend. And we'll preview a night of music and poetry with Potsdam poet Stephanie Coyne to get. It's a poem about a bird who's died and it's, for me, the natural world sometimes talks about bigger things. It talks to me about ways I can understand that I can make sense of the world. All of that and more is coming up on Northern Light. Stick with us. Broadcast of Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio is supported by St. Lawrence Health, offering my care, a way for patients to access health information and stay connected to their care team. Registration is available at stlawrencehealthsystem.org. And by the Depot Theater, Westport, a professional equity theater in the Adirondacks, celebrating its 45th season, depotheater.org. This is Northern Light. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. North Country Congresswoman Elise Stefanik is claiming an impeachment inquiry against President Biden has resulted in staggering evidence of wrongdoing. Her claim comes despite a lack of any evidence tying the Democrat to wrongdoing as the probe continues. Speaking during a weekly briefing Wednesday in Washington, Stefanik said House Republicans will launch a website where people can find updates on the inquiry this week. It also includes a timeline which lays out exactly what the Biden crime family did to get us to this point. Transparency is the hallmark of America. With each new fact, we find it becomes more clear that Joe Biden is compromised and unfit to lead. House Republicans have yet to provide any concrete proof of wrongdoing by President Biden. His son, Hunter Biden, is offering to testify publicly before Congress following a subpoena from House Republicans looking into nearly every part of his business dealings. Biden is rejecting the closed-door testimony requested in the subpoena, saying it could be manipulated. On Wednesday, a federal court sentenced a mother and son from Watertown for their participation in the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. Both received five years of probation, starting with periods of home incarceration, according to the Watertown Daily Times. Marianne Mooney Rondon will be incarcerated at her home for one year. Her son, Raphael Rondon, received 18 months of home incarceration, which will start after he completes another prison sentence for a separate weapons charge. Both mother and son were part of the mob of supporters of former President Donald Trump that stormed the U.S. Capitol building while Congress was in the process of certifying that Joe Biden had won the 2020 presidential election. Mooney Rondon helped steal the laptop of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. She was convicted of aiding and abetting the theft of government property in March. She was also found guilty of obstructing an official proceeding. Prosecutors had asked the court to give her a prison sentence of almost four years. Her son, Raphael Rondon, was also convicted of obstructing an official proceeding. Mooney Rondon will also pay $7,500 fine, and she and her son will each pay thousands of dollars in restitution. SUNY Potsdam is cutting nine degree programs over the next few years to deal with a structural deficit of $9 million. Like other SUNY campuses, it's been dealing with declining enrollment for years. Another tactic the school is considering to deal with its financial problems is to rethink how it uses its buildings. Lucy Grinden has more. At the end of October, SUNY Potsdam established a new committee to review the use of its buildings. One of their early conclusions was to tear down Dunn Hall. 
It housed the Crane School of Music between the late 50s and the early 70s. It's currently occupied by the Departments of Computer Science and Business Administration and some other faculty offices and classrooms. But the building's condition is deteriorating, according to an email from the provost. State Assembly member Scott Gray of Watertown says empty and deteriorating buildings are a problem across the SUNY system, especially with fewer students on campuses. Even when schools aren't using the buildings, they still have to pay to maintain them. Their resources, in the case of Potsdam, precious resources, are being drained by, um, you know, excess space on campus. Gray has proposed a bill that would make the state take inventory of decommissioned buildings throughout the SUNY system. The goal would be to figure out what buildings can be repurposed for potential uses like housing or child care. He got the idea after a couple visits to SUNY Potsdam around the time of its downsizing announcement in September. We got talking about uh, excess fixed assets, such as buildings. And then it led to, you know, if you did not have to take care of these buildings would that free up some revenue for you for your core mission which is educating young adults gray says his bill does not always advocate for demolition but that sometimes destroying a building is going to be the right long-term financial decision lucy grinden north country public radio Today marks the 35th annual World AIDS Day, a reminder of the global struggle to end HIV-related stigma and an opportunity to honor those lost to the AIDS epidemic. Over the past 35 years, there's been significant progress in addressing HIV and AIDS thanks to advancements in medical research and increased access to treatment and prevention and a broader understanding of the virus. This year's theme is Remember and Commit. Hundreds of World AIDS Day events are being held across the world to raise awareness, to show support for people with li- living with HIV. The New York State Department of Health's Ending the Epidemic Summit was held this week in Albany. At a panel discussion yesterday, Alex Sun, a 25-year-old Cambodian-American who's living with HIV, uh, HIV, paid tribute to an older generation of people living with HIV, AIDS, and the stigma. I've heard stories of folks not being able to eat at like a family's house or they would throw away their plates or not be able to get care inside of a hospital. And so I'm trying to lead with pride and who I am and try to make it easier for the younger generation so that they don't have to live in the same stigma that I have to face. Some of the events commemorating World AIDS Day include a red ribbon flag raising ceremony in front of the Centennial Flame on Parliament Hill in Ottawa and the start of Indigenous AIDS Awareness Week in Canada. SUNY Canton is starting a new scholarship program for full-time students interested in 12 specific majors, according to the Watertown Daily Times. Those majors include accounting, healthcare management, and electrical engineering technology. Awards will range from $1,000 to $10,000. Scholarships for some majors will only be available to students coming from out of state or outside the region. Students from the North Country will be eligible for scholarships in several engineering technology programs. To be eligible, Students will also need to live on SUNY Canton's campus and keep their grades up. Listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. It's nine minutes past nine, past eight, rather. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Todd Mo, And I'm Monica Sandresky. Just ahead, we'll take a look at a few of the events happening in Plattsburgh this weekend, plus music and poetry tonight in Potsdam. All of that and more is coming up in just a few minutes here on Northern Light. <laughs> Music by Phoenix Jazz Collective in Potsdam. 
Northern Light is supported by Adirondack Foundation and the Adirondack Birth to Three Alliance, dedicated to providing all children the best possible start in life, adirondackbt3.org, and the Alzheimer's Disease Caregiver Support Initiative, offering hope with Project Lifesaver, a research and recovery program that uses technology to find seniors who wander. Details at wehelpcaregivers.com. It's 10 minutes past 8. Over the last few years, murals have been popping up all over the city of Glens Falls. Big and small, they've been breathing new color into the downtown area. Some have been funded by the city's downtown revitalization grant. Others are paid for by business owners. And there are a lot more to come. Amy Feireisel reports from downtown Glens Falls. Hannah Williams is a muralist, and we're at 20 Warren Street, the site of Williams' biggest mural yet. In this scene, I have a black bear, I have a barred owl, moon, and I have some native plants and flowers like milkweed, lady slippers. And it's big. I mean, it's like the whole side of this building. We're talking 70 feet long and three stories tall. To paint it, Williams had to learn to operate a boom lift. That was really empowering in itself and a great kind of asset to add to my tool belt. For two and a half weeks last summer, Williams spent 10 plus hour days on it. That's how I am. I'm obsessed when I get into a project. It's just like all else goes out the window and I'm I'm in, so. Williams is local. She grew up in nearby Queensbury and lives there now. She says this mural, which was commissioned by the city, was a career high. It just meant so much to kind of be a part of history in the sense of we've never really had much public art before prior to this. But she says in just the past few years, the tides have really turned. She estimates over 15 murals have gone up in the last year. Downtown Glens Falls is looking pretty colorful. Let's see. We're we'll across the road, right? Yeah, we'll cross the road. And You can basically take a mural tour on foot. There's plenty to see. Williams herself has painted 30 murals in the last decade, and several are within walking distance. We head over to Glen Street, where there are lots of small retail and food stores. No matter what, the past decade, this has been a revolving coffee shop. So Crew Coffee has been here for a handful of years now. Inside, on the wall across from a gleaming bar, is a big mural Williams painted about two years ago. It's of the coffee plant, painted in the style of a botanical illustration. The colors depict the different maturity, so they're mature, like, at red, and, like, green is when they're new. Um, Raymond Dandria is slinging coffee behind the bar. He's 32 years old and a Glens Falls native. He's loved seeing the murals go up. You know, just showing people, like... You know, art's alive, I feel like. He sees it as catching up because they have great local artists. It seemed like Glens Falls was a little bit behind. And, like, you know, we live around, like, Vermont, other little towns that already did that or shown that. So it was definitely cool to see us, like, get with the groove. We head out the back door and turn a corner, where we're hit by images of geometric hot air balloons and the Adirondack foothills. This is another mural commissioned by the city. It was painted by a Californian artist named Jesse Melanson. He worked on it at the same time as Williams. It was cool. Like While I was working on it on the boom lift, I could look over and see him up on the scissor lift and we would wave. We visit another half dozen murals around the city center and then head east to the Glens Falls Shirt Factory, a huge historic brick building that used to be home to the McMullen-Levins Company. Now it's filled with artist studios and galleries. In front of it is essentially a big industrial parking lot. You know, gravel everywhere and these small buildings and then the the shipping containers. But in the not-too-distant future, William says this space will be bursting with art and life. Essentially, we have five acres we can kind of work with to develop over the next 10 years. It's like a 10-year plan to create more of a public art space and venue. Williams says it's called Mural Garden. That will have a projected 80 to 100 murals, depending on what kind of surfaces, um, shipping containers, fences, building murals. Mural Garden is the brainchild of Eric Uncoff, who owns the shirt factory. Williams is on the Mural Garden board, and she painted the first mural on an old trailer here in 2021 with another local artist, Rob Harriman. 
Uh, Rob and I kind of came up with a design of just something you would never see in real life. It's of whales in space. It's ridiculous and a lot of fun and kind of the point. William says they want Mural Garden to be a space where artists can run free. Oftentimes, the muralists like myself or artists in general, obviously you have to work with the client with what they want. And so one of the biggest components here is that artists have the freedom to create what they want to create. Things really got kicked off this past July during the first mural thon when six artists painted new murals here on the sides of shipping containers. William says the mural garden board has lots of plans. Landscaping with native plants, painting the shirt factory smokestack, bringing in kids to do murals. It's a big vision for the space and for Glens Falls. I really try to stress to people that bringing public art, whether it's sculpture, installation, murals, can bring economic value to areas. And Williams thinks Glens Falls is perfectly positioned to take advantage of that with its proximity to the Adirondacks, Albany, and New York City. This area is special, too. Uh, I've talked to so many people who have moved away and have come back. A lot of families that have been moving to Glens Falls specifically. It's such a great time for them and an exciting time in Glens Falls. William says she's thrilled that public art will play a big role in the city's growing future. Amy Feireisel, North Country Public Radio in Glens Falls. This story was part of our ongoing series on public art. You can check out the NCPR mural map at ncpr.org slash mural map. You're listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. Coming up in just a minute, music and poetry in Potsdam tonight, plus our girl Kara Chapman stopping by to let us know what's cooking in at Plattsburgh this weekend. Then stick around after the show. We'll stop by a whimsical birdhouse city in Ontario. That's coming up in 842. But first, Todd has a look at the weather for us. We've got clouds and rain for much of the North Country today, maybe some snow showers tonight and some mixed precipitation through the weekend. Gray and cloudy at this point right through the early part of next week. Some rain today continuing, about a 90, 95% chance of rain probably this afternoon, tonight as well. Highs 40s, lows 30s, then tomorrow mostly cloudy, some mixed precipitation Saturday and Sunday with highs upper 30s, low 40s, and then that wintry mix continuing into Monday and Tuesday of next week. And uh, right now in Canton, we have uh, cloudy skies, 46 degrees. John Warren checks the latest outdoor conditions as we head into the weekend. On Saturday, sunrise will be at about 712 and sunset at about 418. We're looking at some unsettled weather through the weekend with snow and or rain, depending on your local temperature. Temperatures on high peak summits are expected to range from about 30 to about 35 through the weekend, with wind chills into teens today and mid-20s tomorrow and Sunday. Be prepared for wet and snowy conditions. Carry traction devices and use them when necessary to avoid injuries. If you're headed to summits, carry snowshoes, as some areas at the highest elevations have as much as 18 inches to 2 feet of snow. Elsewhere, snow depths range from 3 to 4 inches at the periphery of the Adirondack Park to 18 inches in the higher elevations of Hamilton County and much of eastern Essex County at mid-elevations. There is about a foot of snow at Olmsteadville in southwestern Essex County and at Old Forge, about 9 inches at Paseco and Indian Lake, about 6 or 7 inches in Newcomb, Indian Lake, Racket Lake, North Hudson, and down in Chestertown in northern Warren County. There is about 3 to 4 inches at the base of Whiteface and the lower elevations around Saranac and Tupper Lakes and at Lake Placid. Waters are beginning to ice over everywhere, although no ice should yet be considered safe. Whiteface is expected to have a few lifts open, along with about a dozen trails, but no beginner terrain open yet. Gore will have about the same, with the addition of Top Ridge, which is opening today and is groomed top to bottom. Macaulay Mountain in Old Forge is hoping to open December 9th, 
Hickory Mountaineer Warrensburg is raising money and hopes to open in mid-December. If you are looking for groomed cross-country trails, you can find a variety of terrain, including some tracks set at Lapland Lake near Northville and also at Garnered Hill near North Creek. At Pole Smith's, there is some terrain open, but with thin cover, so bring your rock skis. If you're looking for some backcountry skiing, stick to the smoother terrain. The road into Boris Ponds is skiable, as is the Newcomb Lake Road. The Whiteface Toll Road is being skied, and although some reports are calling the route to Marcy Dam skiable, there are main obstacles. From the dam to Avalanche Pass is not yet recommended, but once you are up in the pass, there is about 18 inches of snow. Those are the outdoor conditions in the Adirondacks this weekend. For North Country Public Radio, this is John Warren from the New York Almanac, online at newyorkalmanac.com. You're listening to Northern Light right here on North Country Public Radio. It's 20 after 8. Good morning. I'm Monica Sandreski. Potsdam fiddler Gretchen Kohler writes her music with Adirondack tradition bearers in mind. In the last couple of years, she wrote a series of tunes called Fiddling with Tradition with pianist Daniel Kelly, inspired by guideboat builders, rug braiders, and blacksmiths in the area. Our Todd Moe was even part of that project. Well, now they're putting together an evening of music inspired by poets. It's tonight at 7 o'clock at the Potsdam Public Library, and they're calling it Sit by the fire, and we have a small preview of it. I caught up with one of the featured poets, SUNY Potsdam creative writing professor Stephanie Coyne de Get, who introduced her piece, Frangilla Rosa Day. It's called Frangilla Rosa Day. And Fringilla Rosa Day is a term that's a mashup of Fringilla Day, which is an, an avian name for a family of birds. It's finches, you know, gold finches and, and crossbills. And for the sake of this poem, pine siskins. And uh, Rosa Day is a botanical family. So that's hawthorns and apples and roses. The meld of the title is sort of the meld in mind of spirit of of what's happening in the poem. It is, um, well, it, it's a it's a poem about a bird who's died and it's, it, there's, for me, the natural world sometimes talks about bigger things. It talks to me about ways I can understand that I can make sense of the world. And it doesn't happen with everything I see, but, at the time that I found this pine siskin, I was, I was grappling with the imminent loss of someone I loved. And so those thoughts and the thoughts of this bird fused for me. And so this is where that poem comes from. Could you read it for us? Sure. Fringilla Rosa Day. A pine siskin with butter-edged wings shivers with some unknowable discomfort of breath or bone. Down feather, phyloplume, semi-plume, vein and hollow shaft, so much refinement of detail in just its feathers alone. What to do with this small, still elaboration of cartilage and plumage found dead by the garden, but to plant it in hope that all its avian detail will bloom again in spring, nest again in high spruce, weave again moss and rootlet, Hatch again, pale green eggs, wreathed with small sable specks. Perhaps not, perhaps no bud blossoms into flight. Believe instead in an Ava horticulture, a pine siskin, a trowel's depth below the rose bush, and somehow vertebral ribs, needle-like bones, zygomatic bar dissolve in the damp closeness of well-spaded earth. Articulated skeleton, femur, and pygostyle become articulation of pinnate leaf and stem. Allular digit to briar and bristle, small bit of cliff bone and curve bone and tongue bones, whose definition in garden earth to the serrate leaf edge, butter edged wing to pink edged thorn, small sharp beak to small sharp thorn. What part siskin in the bloom of this old rose bush? What cinnamon old rose scent will release in warm June sun? The siskin's small buzzing song. Thank you, Stephanie. Who did you write that for? Oh, a, a family member who was slipping away. And I was, didn't realize as I was responding to the sort of what next. With birds, 
creatures I respond to fairly fully anyway. I mean, poetry is not an on-the-nose kind of thing, so it was a very long time before I realized what the poem was saying back to me. I mean, and very simply, what next? How does it translate? And so eventually, when I looked at the poem, I thought of, well, of course. That's what those that's what those thoughts were about. But it is, you know, how we process things from ourselves to ourselves. Stephanie Coyne de Ghent is one of several Adirondack poets reading at the Potsdam Public Library tonight, starting at 7 o'clock. It's a night of music and poetry called Sit by the Fire. Others include Kim Bouchard, Kylie Frank, Dale Hobson, who used to work here at NCPR, Jan Hutzler, and Neil Burdick. And the music we heard just a moment ago was The Fox's Wedding, performed by Gretchen Kohler and Daniel Kelly. So many events going on throughout the region, including in Plattsburgh. It is quite the weekend there. And here to tell us more about uh, what's cooking in Plattsburgh is our very own Champlain Valley reporter, Kara Chapman. Hey, Kara. Hi, Monica. How are you? I'm. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no one ever asked me that. No one cared. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> thank you. I'm doing really good. How are you doing this morning? I'm good. I'm good. Just excited to talk about everything going on in the Lake City this weekend. Yeah, it's totally packed. And and uh, like you've said, it starts today, doesn't it? It does. The SUNY Plattsburgh men's and women's ice hockey teams have home games today and tomorrow. Both of them, it's really exciting. They're undefeated so far this season. They play SUNY. Uh, they both play SUNY Cortland today. And then tomorrow, the women play SUNY Canton. And the men have their rivalry game against Oswego State. So that should be a pretty big game. Oh, man. Yes, yes. A lot of uh, a lot of intensity there. Well, and I want to chime in, too, to, to remind folks that mm-hmm. still on campus tomorrow while we're staying there is the Plattsburgh. Pittsburgh Gospel Choir's holiday show, A Soulful Christmas. Um, That gospel choir is led by Dexter Chris, Andrea Ogle. They do just such a tremendous job. They'll have Mm -hmm. selections like energetic renditions of O Come All You Faithful. I know um, there's um, an adaptation of uh, Three Kings that Dexter Chris wrote himself. And that's uh, tomorrow at uh, 5 o'clock at um, Hawkins Hall there at, at SUNY Plattsburgh. Um, but you've got more events to tell us about. I'm thinking of uh, the big one, Miracle on Margaret Street. It is the yes. talk of the town. It is, yes. If you find yourself downtown tomorrow, it's going to be pretty hard to miss. The Miracle on Margaret Street is this, uh, it's a big collaboration between the city and the Strand Center for the Arts. The Strand's having a bunch of stuff like a Nutcracker performance. There's all sorts of kids activities going on. And they're also having their um, their annual Mary Mugs fundraiser, which is where their Clay Studio students kind of make these mugs that that, um, are sold on behalf of the Strand to benefit the Clay Studio there. So that's pretty cool. And then there's also the big holiday parade and tree lighting ceremony. Um, the theme of this year's parade is Winter Wonderland in the North Country. And all the floats in there will be competing, you know, for best group and other categories. And this year's Grand Marshals are Chris and Stan Ransom, who've been heavily involved with the Battle of Plattsburgh commemoration each year, which is pretty cool. Um, just for some timestamps, the pre-parade warm-up starts at 5. There's music and dance performances. And then the parade starts at 5.30. And the tree lighting, which is, um, it's the tree that's on the Strand's front lawn, is uh, right after that to kind of cap things off. Right on. And there's a drag show too, right? Yes, there is. Um, the local drag group House of Stars will be performing at Old Soul Design Shop after the tree lighting. Um, and what's cool is they're going to be raising money and collecting toys for the local Christmas Bureau. Well, and there, um, that sounds fantastic. And there's another event happening this weekend that I know that you have been very excited about, the annual Cat Art Show. 
Yes, I am. Yes. Uh, So it takes place at Chapter One Coffee and Tea every year. All kinds of different art um, and all the proceeds raised uh, go to the Elmore SPCA out in Peru, an organization close to my heart because that's where I got one of my cats. Oh, I love it. That's so wonderful. Kara Chapman, thank you so much for coming on to let us know about what to do in Plattsburgh this weekend. Yes. Thanks for having me, Monica. That's it for the show. Morning Edition continues in just a minute. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. Be well.